Hello, everybody, and welcome to our next lecture of 6838. It's a pleasure to see you all virtually again today. Uh, today, we're going to continue our discussion of basic geometry, but we're going to bump things up by just one dimension. So we've now wrapped up our discussion of curves, both in the plane and 3D, and very briefly in n dimensions, I guess. And now uh, we're going to start the next big unit in this course, which has to do with the differential geometry of surfaces. Uh, certainly a lot of the machinery that was developed in differential geometry originally appeared for two-dimensional surfaces embedded in three dimensions. And the reason that we start there is that this is sort of the most concrete example of differential geometric computation beyond just a simple one-dimensional case. What we'll find later on in this course is that a lot of the two-dimensional calculations that we do carry directly to higher dimensional geometry without really any change. So this is a great place to start. And it also has the added benefit of being a space that we can visualize. You know, we're all used to looking at two-dimensional surfaces in our everyday life. So our basic outline for today is going to be to define what is a surface, just the same way that we defined what is a curve a few lectures ago. And after that, uh, we're going to go through how to store a surface on a computer uh, and the basic representation that we'll work with a lot in this course, which is a triangle mesh, uh, as well as a few other basic considerations in representing surface geometry. Uh, the kind of convenient thing is since we spent two whole lectures establishing the differential geometry of curves in this course, establishing the basics for surfaces is only going to take us, you know, roughly one, maybe one and a half. After that, we're going to dive right into my favorite topic in 2D geometry, which is defining and working with curvature. Okay, so basically what's next in this course is to step up one dimension from curves to surfaces. We're going to start by defining surfaces, uh, and then in the next couple lectures, develop theory of curvature, distance, and so on. Just the same as we had curvature for curves, arc length, and everything else that we saw in the one dimensional case. So specifically today, we're going to talk about what it means to be a surface, like how to define surfaces theoretically. We'll talk about discrete representations of surface geometry, like how can we represent and store a surface on a computer. And we'll also briefly mention some higher dimensional constructions just as analogs of our two dimensional ones, but they're really not our focus of discussion in today's lecture. So the good thing is that essentially, Bumping up from curves to surfaces is, in some sense, the really hard thing. If we also want to bump from surfaces to n-dimensional geometry, the basic definitions really don't change all that much. Uh, essentially, it's somewhat of an easier transition. And so I think it's quite worthwhile to spend a significant amount of time talking about surfaces, even if your goal in taking 6838 is to study higher dimensional geometry, for example, for learning applications, simply because they're concrete geometric objects we can use to develop intuition for the fancy high dimensional calculations we might do in another lecture or in a different course. Now, of course, well, the basics of bumping up from two to n dimensions is somehow straightforward given our bump from one to two dimensions. That's not universally true. Um, so for example, some huge branches of geometry and topology are, for whatever reason, much easier in even dimensional spaces than in odd dimensional spaces. Like three dimensional topology is like this entire nightmare that I wish I understood. Um, but at least for the basics, it's all about the same. So our focus today is going to be on embedded surfaces. So there's two key words when I say that. The first one is embedded. What that means is that our geometry, like this pig here, <laughs> is actually sitting in 3D. So a surface is a two-dimensional object, and it's embedded in the three-dimensional world around us. And so essentially, we're going to have to define what it means to be intrinsically two-dimensional. Intrinsically meaning like the actual geometric that, object that we care about is somehow two-dimensional, like a surface, just a thin sheet sitting in space, but we're going to allow ourselves the luxury of having our geometry sit in some higher dimensional space, in this case just 3D, because that's how we're going to essentially inherit some of the geometric structure, right? Uh, Three-dimensional Cartesian, whatever you want to call it, coordinates are already accompanied with perfectly reasonable measuring sticks, dot products, lengths, and so on, that we can kind of restrict to our surface and inherit geometry that way. Later on, uh, when we discuss Riemannian geometry, we're going to try and 
distance ourselves from this Euclidean perspective a little bit and ask whether we can define what it means to be a surface or more generally a manifold, like a piece of geometry, without relying on that geometry sitting in Euclidean space. But we'll see that that's a more advanced perspective and one that requires I think calculations and definitions that are a lot more abstract. So for now, we're going to stick with the more concrete case of embedded geometry, mostly embedded just in 3D, so we can actually look at it. So the question that we need to start with today is a very straightforward one, and it's sort of analogous to what we asked in our last uh, few lectures on curves. And essentially the question that we have to ask is, what is an embedded surface? So we have to ask, what is a surface? Like when we, we look around us, for example, I'm looking in this film studio, I see plenty of objects that I would probably abstract as a surface, you know, a table, the top of my laptop, the chair, my watch, whatever. A surface is somehow a two-dimensional object sitting in 3D, but of course, to work with it mathematically, we need to add more detail to that definition. And hopefully I convinced you two lectures ago that making these sorts of definitions is both non-trivial and a valuable exercise. That it's not true that an embedded surface is just like a function or some, something I can draw a picture of. To really develop what it means to be a surface rigorously and carefully requires a bit of work and you know, to make sure that we understand every possible detail. So if you recall from our lecture on smooth curves, the way that we went about defining curves was sort of in two steps, right? We, we started by talking about functions, right? And justifying why a curve is not just a function of one variable. Then we kind of souped up that simple intuition into a full-on definition of curves as a locus of points sitting in some Euclidean space where locally I can zoom in and parametrize the neighborhood around every point. But as a third step, we also define an object called a parametrized curve, where it really was given by a function just uh, with some certain properties. So for today, I thought maybe we'd start by defining a parametrized surface. So in other words, the sort of identification between surfaces and functions that we can do at least locally, and then make the full definition, which is a bit more involved and abstract. So that is to say that as a warm up, we can talk about what it means to derive, or rather define, a parametric surface, or essentially a function of two variables that traces out a piece of surface geometry, like what we see in the image here. So if I draw you this picture here, it's quite suggestive, right? That essentially we can think of a parametric surface as somehow identified with functions f of x comma y, where x and y are in the two-dimensional Euclidean plane, and then f maps into 3D. Um, and for differentiable f, we're most of the way there. But just as we saw some examples in one dimension for curves that kind of broke our geometric intuition, we can see that something very similar is going to happen here. In particular, let me give you three different pathological cases that we might worry about. Now, um, in particular, take a look at these three functions here. Now, these are all functions f of u comma v, right? So they all map from the two-dimensional Euclidean plane into three-dimensional space. But I would argue that these three things don't lead us to a good differentiable surface, and for three very different reasons. Now probably the second example here, f of u comma v equals zero comma zero comma zero, is the simplest example of what can go wrong, right? I mean, so in the second example here, essentially, we haven't defined a surface, we've defined a point, right? All it does is takes u, v as input, ignore that input, and give us back the origin in 3D, right? So I think we would all agree that the second function is not a surface. What about the first function? What goes wrong there? I mean, initially, this kind of looks okay, right? I mean, these are u, u squared, and cosine of u are, you know, infinitely differentiable. They don't have any stationary points that are smooth. So why is this first one not a surface? Well, if we step back and think about it, one thing that you might notice on the right-hand side of this first expression is that there's no v. Right, so it inputs u comma v, but the reality is it ignores that v variable and only computes a point in 3D as a function of u, u squared, cosine u. So in fact, even though the 
first function looks like a function of two variables, it's not, right? It's just a function of one. And really, this first guy is just tracing out a curve. So now we're starting to see what can go wrong. But that's actually not everything that can go wrong. The third example here is probably the most subtle or challenging one to detect. And this is a failure, not necessarily of being a two-dimensional surface, but certainly of being a two-dimensional differentiable or differential surface. So um, here we have f of u comma v equals u v cubed v squared. We'll see that it's a function of both u and v. It kind of has that nice two-dimensional structure. But take a look at the image at the bottom here. What does this look like? So essentially all I've done is I've plugged in a bunch of uv values and plotted the resulting surface. And what we see is that for the most part it actually is a surface, but there's a line of points where it's not. And what's going on here? Well, if you take a look at the y and z components of our function here, so v cubed and v squared, you may recognize these functions as exactly the same functions we used to trace out a cusp in our, our lecture on curves, right? So this third guy, essentially, the u variable is just sliding which plane I'm on, right? Like that's kind of looking into the camera and the uh, scene that we have here. But now for a fixed u, you know, it's tracing out a curve, right? Like one of the slices of this domain. And in that case, that curve is v cubed at comma v squared. And that curve has a cusp. We already showed that in a previous lecture. So in other words, what goes wrong here is that the surface does look like a surface, but not a differentiable one, right? We have a cusp right here, uh, uh, <laughs> which corresponds to the v equals zero uh, locus of points, now kind of dragged out over a range of u's. So a topologist might call this a surface, like just a creased surface, but if we're going to do differential geometry, then we need derivatives defined everywhere, and at this cusp point, we don't have them. So we're going to rule out this case. So hopefully I've convinced you that just defining a differentiable surface is already a tricky matter, even if we're willing to make that parametric assumption. So here's how we can do it. As a tiny bit of review, Remember that for a smooth, or at least a differentiable function f, which goes from rm to rn, I'm going to try and be consistent about our choice of m and n today, but I make that mistake a lot, so we'll see if I succeed. Um, we can define the Jacobian matrix, whose elements ij are given by the uh, jth derivative of the ith component of our function f. So this is just a giant matrix of all of the possible ways that I could differentiate f. Now, you might recall that there's a pretty simple schematic for understanding what the Jacobian uh, tells us. So in particular, let's say that we draw a picture of our, our domain here. So here is the u v plane. Now we have a function uh, f, which is mapping into 3D, right? So it's like tracing out some patch in 3D like that. So maybe I label these x, y, uh, z. I can check really quick. These are indeed right-handed. Um, OK, so here's our, our basic uh, picture. Then if I take a point somewhere inside of the plane, then what is the Jacobian really doing? Well, that point has some image on our parametric surface. Let's call that f of p. And locally, I can approximate my function f at the point p just using a Taylor series. Right? So very roughly, we can think of f on, I don't know, let's say at a, a different point q. Well, it's approximately what to first order? f of p plus df, maybe evaluated at p, however you want to write that, multiplied by q minus p plus, you know, higher order terms. Uh, I guess you can write q minus p squared. Okay, that's supposed to be an O. <laughs> so in this expression here, what is it saying? That essentially the Jacobian term, right, this Jacobian matrix, is telling us something about linearly how to approximate our curved domain with a plane. So what can go wrong? Well, in particular, what could go wrong, let's say that df were actually equal to zero. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, then it doesn't look like this tangent plane that I've drawn here, but rather df doesn't do anything, right? If df equals zero, then no points move anywhere. Or similarly, if df were rank one, right? So the rank of the matrix is less than full rank, then really you would, you're not gonna get a tangent plane, you're gonna get like that cusp surface, like what I drew um, the previous slide, where on the bottom here, uh, df kind of fails to give us interesting information in the direction orthogonal to the cusp curve and only tells us interesting stuff in the direction where it is well defined. So we need to somehow avoid all of these cases and make sure that our parametric surface has a well defined tangent plane at every possible point and that is essentially how we're going to make our definition of a parametric surface. So if we continue to think about it a little bit or you go back and review your calculus class then I think the definition that we can all agree on is actually quite simple. What it says is that a parametric surface, sure, it's given by a function from the plane into 3D, but that function has to satisfy a particular property, which is that df, that Jacobian matrix, right, this guy in our Taylor series, has to be full rank at every single point in Rm, or at least the region in Rm that we're using to define our surface, if it's just like a little patch. And essentially, that full rank condition is designed to avoid this case that we saw before, where we no longer can have a cusp. In fact, I encourage all of you guys to pause this video, go back to our cusp surface, compute df, and you'll see that it fails to be full rank right along this crease curve here. Okay, so now we've managed to define a parametric surface. A parametric surface is given by a function f from the UV plane into 3D. And it satisfies the property that the Jacobian df, which is, I guess, a three by two matrix, is full rank, or in particular, rank two uh, in this case. All right, so let's pause and erase really quick. And now we can continue. All right, so now we've defined a parametric surface, but just like curves, somehow parametric surfaces are a little unsatisfying. Uh, in particular, they are relying on having a function, but of course many functions could trace out the same surface, just as the same as many functions could trace out the same curve in our uh, previous uh, lecture when we were defining curves. In fact, moreover, I challenge the people that are watching this video to come up with a single parametric function f from R2 to R3 that covers this triple torus here. I think it's really hard. So the reality is that there are plenty of surfaces that are embedded in 3D where the parametric definition really isn't enough. Now, notice that this is actually slightly different than the case of curves. So for curves, the reality is that every smooth curve is a parametric curve and vice versa uh, up to self-intersection. That isn't really the case for surfaces. It's not clear that every smooth surface, like this crazy one here, can be given by a single function f from the plane. In fact, certainly that's not the case here topologically, uh, unless you're willing to maybe wrap over it a few times. And even if you are, I, uh, I'm not 100% sure you could, you could pull this one off. But thankfully, our definition of curves from two lectures ago can come to the rescue again. So remember that when we defined a curve, a curve was really just a set of points. It wasn't a function, and it was a set of points where if I took a neighborhood around every point, I could parametrize. Right? So our definition looks something like this slide here, right? where around every point P, there existed a neighborhood U in which our curve looked one-dimensional. This is different from just saying a curve is a single function f of t. So we can do pretty much an identical thing to define a surface. In particular, just like curves, a surface is a set of points sitting in 3D that is endowed with certain properties. It is not a single function. And in fact, that little detail, while it might have felt pedantic for curves, is really critical for surfaces because I think functions are really the wrong abstraction when you have surfaces that wrap over themselves, have interesting topologies, and so on. So then we have to ask, what is a better way to define a surface? And the good news is that your instructor, who has done this many times in the past, kind of purposefully chose a definition of curves that is suggestive of what we'll do today. In particular, 
our theoretical definition of a surface is going to follow a very similar schematic to how we defined a curve when we were doing that in the smooth differential geometry lecture two lectures ago. So here we have a surface, this double torus, and there's a few properties that we should note in the schematic that we've drawn here. In particular, notice that our smooth surface is sitting in R3, right? That's what makes it a surface embedded in 3D. But if I take any point, right, like this little red neighborhood, and I intersect my surface with a little ball, right inside of that ball, my surface looks like a piece of the plane, right? So it kind of looks like a parametric surface in every neighborhood of a little point. Now, since 6838 is a graduate course and we only have so much time, rather than going through the definition of a surface without boundary and then a surface with boundary and then a manifold without boundary and then a manifold with boundary, I decided to give you guys a hard time and jump right to the most difficult definition. And this is the definition of a sub-manifold of Rn. So the basic idea in differential geometry is that we study these objects called manifolds. And the term manifold is a generalization of what it means to be a curve or a surface or volume, whatever. It is an m-dimensional object, and when we use the sub part of submanifold, we're going to assume that that m-dimensional object is sitting in Rn. So let's do a few examples. So for example, let's say that I have a curve in the plane. So there's my curve, it's sitting in R2. Well, my curve is intrinsically one-dimensional. And here, because I situated my curve in the plane, I would write n equals 2. Okay, so similarly, if I have, you know, a torus, there he is, and he's sitting in R3, well now my m is equal to 2 because the torus is a surface, like a donut, just the outside part of the donut, not the inside, uh, and it's sitting in 3D, right, that's these three axes here, so uh, n is equal to 3. It's supposed to be an n, in case you're wondering. <laughs> okay, so we're jumping right to, right to that definition, and in fact, we're going to allow our sub-manifold to have boundary. What does that mean? Well, so far, I keep drawing the same little picture, and it's only because mostly your instructor is just really bad at drawing, but the, the sort of schematic I keep drawing for a surface is that it looks something like this, right? So here's 3D space, and my surface looks something like this patch here. But this has a particular element to it that we haven't really discussed, which is this outside part, right? So if I choose a point on the outside part of my surface, well, it doesn't look like the plane locally. You know, if I'm an ant walking along the surface, I just reach an endpoint, which is a little weird. So how are we going to essentially deal with that? We're going to say that our surface doesn't have to look like the plane everywhere. But every patch on my surface, at least, has to look like the upper half plane. So there is uh, H2, uh, for example. So if I take a little patch around uh, this boundary point on my surface and I intersect it with the surface, then that looks like the image of some patch in the upper half plane, where this part here that intersects the uh, y equals zero uh, region is essentially uh, going to map to the boundary of my surface sitting in 3D, whereas if I have just a patch sitting up here, that might correspond to some internal part of my surface. So the general definition of the upper half plane is uh, hiding here on the bottom left of the slide. It's essentially just a set of points whose last coordinate is positive. Right? So here's an image of what it looks like in 2D. So now we're starting to get somewhere. A submanifold with boundary is going to be a locus of points in Rn, which looks like Rm locally, but maybe just the upper half part of Rm so that we can allow boundary. And that's essentially what's going on in this definition here. Right, so let's break it down a little bit. So we have an m-dimensional submanifold in Rn. So here is going to be our and that's the space that our manifold is sitting in, and this space that where we've defined our upper half plane is going to be our m, so in general this is hm rather than h2. And what goes on? Well, I take a point, and I intersect the surface with a little neighborhood around that point. And that's not to say that the neighborhood is along the surface, but I could literally take a ball sitting in n-dimensional space, 
and intersect it with the surface. And that, in our definition here, is given the name, uh, let's see here, uh, u, I believe. Nope, sorry, uh, w. W is the one that's sitting out here. So w is like some blobby set which maybe leaves the surface, but when I intersect it, it gives me a local neighborhood around our point p. Then, what is it saying? I intersect the surface with this open neighborhood w around our point. Then, locally in that neighborhood, there exists some parametrization function g from the upper half plane into this neighborhood here, where I draw the pre-image of our neighborhood as u. And I might have to intersect u with the upper half plane so that I can have that boundary. Phew! And then what do I need? Well, I need that g is invertible. So in other words, this is bijective in some little neighborhood. Uh, I want it to be differentiable and that away from this uh, piece here where the y coordinate is equal to zero, I want the Jacobian to be injective or full rank, just like we talked about before. So this is one of those definitions where when I try to talk about it in words, it sounds pretty terrible, but in reality, it's actually not so bad. So rather than belabor the point, what I'm gonna do is encourage you all to sit with it a little bit, kind of bond with this definition um, and, and return to me if you have any questions. So for now, let's erase and keep moving. Okay, so that wraps up our definition. So really, if you step back 10 feet, essentially all we showed is that a surface is locally planar, right? So a surface being the m equals uh, two and n equals three case. Um, and we've revised that a little bit to a surface with boundary is either locally planar or locally half planar. That's basically it. So in addition to defining a surface, there's one more kind of useful space that we're gonna work with a lot in this course, and that is the tangent space to a surface. So remember that you know, we keep drawing our, our same little schematic here. There's our surface. And now a very typical object to work with is to mark some point on our surface and to look at the plane of points that just touch the surface at that location. And that is going to be the tangent plane. So if the point is P, then we're going to give this name uh, to our tangent plane. We're going to call it T sub P of M. So here M stands for the surface. P is telling us where we're going to place the tangent plane. And T stands for tangent plane. And there are actually many different ways to define tangent spaces. I'm going to borrow one from high dimensional geometry that I think is kind of cute. <laughs> so the basic idea here is that I'm going to define the tangent plane to a surface by kind of resorting to curves. It's a really sneaky trick. So here's the idea. So I have some surface. I'll draw a little bigger this time. And I have a point along my surface. Then what is the tangent plane? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider, I'm going to consider any curve gamma that goes through my point P. And I'm going to say that, OK, well, we already know how to define the tangent vector to a curve. We talked about the unit tangent, but a tangent vector would just be like gamma prime. Yeah? And so, OK, if we have a single curve through our point P, that curve has a tangent, which is velocity. But we could draw a lot of different curves, right? We could have a curve that wraps around our donut surface, for example. Uh, and that curve has some other initial velocity. So our definition of tangent space, which I've placed on the slide here, is the space of all possible velocities of curves where the curves are restricted to move along the surface here, or along the manifold more generally, and go through point P at time zero. So gamma is like a car driving along the manifold, and like the clock hits zero, and the car is sitting at point P, and if you look at its velocity, that is a tangent vector to my surface at point P. So if I look at the locus of all possible paths that go through our point, those trace out a plane. That plane is tangent to the surface. And there are many different ways to see that. Uh, so I'll let you guys check this formally at home. It's also discussed in the course notes. One way to do it is to recall this object that we call the differential. Remember that a differential of a function is this little limit that I've written here. And so one thing that's pretty clear uh, that you can check uh, uh, pretty easily computationally is that you can sort of view the tangent plane 
as the image of the differential of a local parameterization. Oof, so that phrase is heavy. So remember that I have some parameterization, which is taking some region in the plane into a region around point P. If I differentiate that map, like I look at DF, and I check out the image of DF, that is going to form the tangent plane at point P. And I think this is something that many of you guys may have encountered in calculus class. It's just a, a point to review and, and think about. So in other words, the tangent space at a point P here can be written in two different ways, and these are the same. We're going to omit the proof, but I encourage you to check it at home. It's just a couple lines. That we can either think of it as the set of all velocities of curves that move along the surface and go through point P, or we can think of it as the image of uh, dg, where g is a local parameterization of the surface. So the second definition is kind of like that Taylor series that we wrote down earlier. And it allows us to actually think about the tangent space as a tangent plane for a surface, for example. So in general, uh, one thing that you can check is uh, that actually the tangent space to an m-dimensional manifold is an m-dimensional subspace. Uh, one other thing that you really should check if you want to be morally correct about it, the second uh, definition, unlike the first one, depends on a choice of a parameterization g. But remember, that's not unique, right? I could have multiple ways to parameterize the same patch on a surface. So if I'd started with that definition, then I would have had to check that it was independent of my choice of g. Now, we're going to make one additional definition. And this one is really specific to sub-manifolds of Rn rather than uh, the more general definition of manifold, which we'll see actually does not admit this. And that definition is the normal space. Normal space is all the things that are perpendicular to tangents. <laughs> so in general, if I have a vector space v, and I write this notation v perp, then what I mean by that is that it's essentially the set of all w such that w dot product v equals 0 for all v in v. Right? So if uh, I have a one-dimensional space like this, and I'm in the plane, then the uh, normal space, uh, or the perpendicular to space to that, would just be 90 degrees to it. Uh, but the more important case is on a surface, again, my boring schematic here, you know, if I have a point and a tangent plane, then the normal space is just this one-dimensional uh, space of vectors that are perpendicular to the surface. Right? We talk about surface normals all the time in computer graphics, and essentially that's what we're going about defining. But I have not defined a normal vector. Like, I haven't just chosen a unit normal vector yet. Instead, I've defined an entire linear subspace of things that are perpendicular to the surface. The reason for that is a little bit sneaky, which is that my definition of a surface with boundary allows really annoying surfaces like the Mobius strip, which this animation is showing. So I can construct a Mobius strip by taking a strip of paper, twisting it one time, and then gluing the ends together. You can see that in this animation here. Now, that surface at every single point admits a normal space, like what I'm showing you here. Right? So that's those green vectors that are spinning around with the animation. What it does not admit is a continuous function which assigns to every single point on that surface a unit normal vector. That is to say that I can't find a map from the surface sitting in 3D to the unit sphere that gives a unit vector at every point without having a discontinuity somewhere. The reason for that is that this surface is not orientable. On the other hand, most of the surfaces that we deal with in geometry processing are orientable, meaning that there's a continuous unit normal field that exists at every single point on the surface. You know, so for example, uh, the unit sphere, oh no, unit sphere here emits uh, uh, normal vectors which are just pointing outward. So I can assign a unit normal vector to every possible point, and that's perfectly fine. So how do we get around that? Well, every surface, orientable or not, admits a normal space because essentially I haven't distinguished up from down, but not every surface admits a unit normal vector, which is a smooth function of where I am along the surface. That is restricted to the orientable case. Okay, let's clean up a little bit. Okay, so one thing that is worth noting is that we keep using the term sub-manifold, and that's kind of funny because we didn't define manifold. It's kind of weird. 
Um, the reality is that there is a manifold out there like Euclidean space, which it's not clear that like Euclidean space is a sub-manifold of something else, but we are pretty sure that it's a piece of geometry. And it, there'd be something really seriously wrong with differential geometry if it couldn't handle flat spaces like the plane. Um, there's a more general definition that's discussed in the course notes that we're going to mostly defer on, which is the more general definition of manifold as a topological space. And this is essentially alleviating our reliance on having our manifold be a sub-manifold of Rn. So essentially, when we talk about a topological manifold, it's just a set where I can essentially take any point in our set and locally make it look like the image of Euclidean space, but the set itself doesn't have to sit in Euclidean space. When I have definitions like that, there's no longer any notion of normal because I can't have a normal vector if there's not an embedding space. I can't leave my domain. All I have are tangents. Um, moreover, in this definition, we haven't told you how to compute the length of a vector or how to even detect if your manifold is orientable. So this is a, a more abstract definition. It's super useful in certain domains, but it's one that we're going to punt on for now. So instead of that, we're going to jump to computational aspects and talk about how to represent and store a discrete surface. Like, how do I make surfaces work on a computer? Obviously, I can't store them just the same way that, you know, there was an infinite dimensional space of curves, so I had to discretize them as uh, polylines. We're going to do something similar with surfaces. Now, unlike curves, well, similar to curves in some respects, but even more so, there are so many different ways that I can represent surfaces. And we're going to call out a laundry list of them at the end of today's lecture. But the one that we're going to focus on in this unit of 638 is a very common representation and one that we all know and love in the computer graphics world. And that's the triangle mesh, like what you're seeing here. Now, what is a triangle mesh? It's exactly kind of what it looks like, right? It's a big pile of triangles, like what you see on the right-hand side. Here on this slide, I'm showing you an extremely famous triangle mesh. That triangle mesh is called the Stanford Bunny. It was one of the very first surfaces that was scanned from a physical object into the digital domain. Um, why, you might ask, was this bunny the one that received this honor? Well, you'll notice that the bunny is made of this really nice terracotta material, uh, which somehow facilitated the reconstruction process. Reconstructing this particular 3D shape is not so hard because the Lambertian shading uh, is basically accurate. Uh, but since then, the technology for 3D scanning and other ways to do surface acquisition or surface design have really gone through the roof. Now, I would encourage you all to take a look at more conventional geometry processing courses for all kinds of discussion of how to obtain and model triangle meshes, whether they come from reconstructing a point cloud, uh, computer-aided design software, uh, and so on. We're largely not going to be able to touch on that in this course, which is focused more on the analytical details, but they're incredibly important, especially in the computer graphics domain. So if we want to define a triangle mesh more formally, I would probably define it as something like the objects that I've given you on the slide here. Now, probably, oops, I'm noticing now there's a slight typo on my slide. Um, that n on the right-hand side should be a 3. So let's pause our video and fix that really quick. Done. <laughs> the nice thing about working with video live is that I can do that kind of thing. OK, so a triangle mesh is a collection of points in 3D, but they're linked into triangles. Right? So we can think of there being a collection of edges of our triangle mesh, like the edges of the triangles, where each edge is like a pair of vertices. Right? So notice that E is a subset of V cross V. And then every triangular face F is going to be a triplet of vertices, right? because three points forms a triangle. There's an obvious question that you should be asking me right now, which is, Justin, why not just use T for triangle? The reason is that we also deal a lot, especially in the computer graphics domain, with tetrahedral meshes. And there's a problem, which is triangles and tetrahedra, they both start with T. <laughs> so the convention is often that we use F uh, for triangular faces <laughs> and then T for tetrahedron. OK. So really, a triangle mesh has structures of different dimensionality, right? There's faces, triangles, which are two-dimensional, right? They're like little pieces of the plane. There's edges, which are one-dimensional, and vertices, which are dimension zero. 
And essentially, when we link them all together, what we're trying to form is an object called a simplicial complex. In fact, a simplicial complex is even more general. It just takes k-dimensional simplices and glues them all together into some discrete, manifold-looking structure. Uh, here, we're just going to worry about manifold, simplicial, two-complices, or surfaces. But in order to complete our definition, just like defining surfaces in the smooth case is a little tricky, it's also tricky to do for discrete surfaces as well. In particular, here's an example of an object that I would call triangle soup. That's actually a technical term. Um, where there's a bunch of triangles, but they're not linked together into some coherent like surface-like structure, right? They're just a bunch of triangles that kind of cover our surface. And so I probably would not consider this to be a discrete surface, or at least a discrete representation of the smooth surface that you see on the left-hand side. Rather, it's just some pile of triangles approximating it. And the reason is that this structure here lacks topology. It lacks a way to connect all of the triangles together. So the first thing we have to do is to find the term I just used, which is topology. Topology is the study of geometric properties that remain invariant under certain transformations. Um, this is obviously a very vague phrase. I think I borrowed it from like dictionary.com, Wikipedia, or something. But uh, the basic idea here is that topology in the context of meshes is telling us how the vertices are connected together, whereas geometry is telling us where the vertices are. And we're going to see that some things that we do are purely topological in nature. So if we move the vertices around, we actually are not going to affect a topological calculation. Think like the number of triangles, right? That doesn't change if I move a vertex. And then other things we do, like computing curvature, are definitely geometric in nature. They depend on positions of points. So when we talk about mesh topology versus geometry, it looks something like this. If I want to say something geometric about a triangle mesh, like the dolphin here, then I might say something like, this vertex is located at position x, y, z. That is a geometric statement about this mesh. On the other hand, if I want to say something topological, I can say something like, these vertices are connected. Right, so in order to define a triangle mesh that actually looks like a surface, we need to put some topological conditions on this giant pile of triangles that we just defined. Uh, just similar to how we say a surface in the smooth case is locally the image of the upper half plane. Okay, so if you want the most general version of the story, the same way that we defined a uh, submanifold of Rn, I encourage you to take a look at the course notes. So the course notes talk about defining an orientable combinatorial manifold. Whew. So that's essentially a way to define this manifold structure in the higher dimensional case, and in fact, to do so without an embedding if you don't want to do that. In lecture, since the next couple lectures in this course are going to focus specifically on surfaces, we're just going to cover the surface case, which is a special case of this fancy structure here. But I do encourage you to give it a read, and you'll see, essentially, it's quite complex to define a manifold in the discrete case. <laughs> complex, like simplicial complex. But more generally, it's, it's quite difficult, uh, because we're trying to glue together objects like triangles and tetrahedra in ways that look like a sort of continuous differentiable object. And there's so many boundary cases that we have to worry about. It's a giant index-related headache, and, and one that's worth appreciating. If you like this kind of thing, you should take an algebraic topology course, where you'll go through these kinds of definitions in excruciating detail. But for now, we're going to focus just on surfaces. So for surfaces, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Probably the simplest one is something called a non-manifold edge. And in fact, if you like go into the computer graphics domain industry, they really do use the word non-manifold, and that's to harken back to the definition that we had before. Now, if you take a look at the edge that I show you on the slide here, right? so three different faces of our mesh meet up, this thing locally does not look like a plane. It also doesn't look like the half plane, right? It doesn't look like any two-dimensional structure we've talked about so far. Locally, it looks like three things meeting together. And so we need to essentially discount this case in our definition of a manifold triangle mesh. So how do we do that? Well, remember that a triangle mesh is a collection of vertices, edges, and faces. Now we're going to put conditions on those edges to make sure they meet up in a manifold way. In particular, if I have a manifold triangle mesh, 
then every edge on my mesh is adjacent to one or two faces, right? So either I have two triangles that meet together and hinge, or I have a boundary triangle, which is not attached to, uh, you know, another face. I suppose this, well, no, uh, never mind. Uh, and then uh, faces are incident to, that are incident to a vertex form either a closed ring or an open fan, right? So either the triangles make a big loop or you have the triangles that can be ordered in a cycle and then they stop. So they don't have to close back up, like on the right-hand side, that'll lead me to a boundary. On the left-hand side, I get an interior point. But these are the only two things that we can have. So these are, sometimes you call this a closed fan and an open fan, depending on, you have this loop of triangles that meet up. Now typically, we don't worry about surfaces that maybe globally intersect themselves. That's so not gonna matter a whole lot for a triangle mesh uh, structure because the topology is sort of unambiguous. Uh, but if you really wanted to resemble the uh, smooth definition of a surface, you wouldn't allow that either. Like a whole chain of triangles where you go around the loop and then there's an intersection. We're not gonna worry about that here. I don't, I don't think that's critically important. Okay, so in our course, when we talk about triangle meshes, we're mostly going to assume that they're manifold for now. Eventually we can relax that assumption, um, but it is gonna make our math a lot easier. And it's often possible to do what people call cleaning, to take a non-manifold mesh and clean it up. And in fact, that's often quite necessary. So um, the assumption that a triangle mesh is manifold is really easy to violate. And it shows up a lot in practice. And this is actually becoming more and more the case as everybody gets excited about the machine learning universe because data is messy. <laughs> so in particular, uh, when people make surfaces in computer-aided design, they often cheat in funny ways. So for instance, let's say that I want to make a table. So if I have the world's simplest table, right, so just a rectangular top with four legs coming in uh, the bottom here, well, if I think of my table as one big manifold surface, it's kind of a complicated one, right? There's the top of the surface, it wraps around to the bottom, it kind of goes down into the legs and so on. But if I'm in computer-aided design or in virtual reality where I'm not gonna do shape analysis, I'm just gonna look at a shape. It's a perfectly legitimate thing to want to do. Then does it actually matter if the chair legs are attached to the tabletop? Well, no. So one thing I can do is just model it by taking a chair league, taking my tabletop and just jamming one into the other, but not actually connecting them into one continuous triangle mesh. So I really end up with just like two rectangles that intersect each other. So if I want to do shape analysis on that object, I have to be quite careful, right? Because points that are not visible, maybe I really should get rid of before I do things like compute curvature. Um, but that's not always obvious from the start. So in like big data sets of 3D shapes, very often you encounter non-manifold uh, points or big triangle soups that you have to clean up uh, a posteriori. Now the basic observation that we're building all the math on in today's lecture and the next couple uh, that, that we do on curvature is that piecewise linear faces, like these triangular faces, are just reasonable blocks for uh, 3D surfaces. And this is just a 3D, or I guess intrinsically 2D analog of the observation that um, polylines are reasonable building blocks for curves, right? And in fact, it's absolutely true that I can take a 3D surface and as long as the surface is smooth and well behaved, I can always tessellate it with triangles and get a pretty good, arbitrarily good approximation. Moreover, there are a lot of other advantages. So for instance, those of you who took my 6837 course know that triangles are pretty straightforward to render on your graphics card or in a ray tracer. Um, you can link triangles together into arbitrary topologies like that donut torus surface I showed you before. Um, that might be trickier, for example, if I have like CAD patches with rectangular shape or something like that. And if I do care about smooth surfaces rather than just these like kind of piecewise flat triangular structures, I can achieve them using techniques like subdivision, refinement, and so on. Now, there is a little bit of terminology I should clarify so when you go talk to your computer graphics friends, you're knowledgeable and say the right thing. Um, in particular, there's invalid meshes and then there's bad meshes. Now, the phrase bad mesh sounds extremely informal, and that's because it is. Now, on the left-hand side of this slide, I'm showing you a manifold triangle mesh of a square, but it's a bad mesh. Uh, in particular, notice that the triangles are all kinds of different areas. Their interior angles are not close to, like, 
I don't know, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, like a nicely shaped triangle. Some of them are really long and slivery. Um, and even though this mesh satisfies all the assumptions that we've set forth, what we're gonna see is that when we start approximating differential quantities from smooth surfaces onto the structure on the left-hand side, this won't be particularly useful, right? And, and, and the reason is that essentially our approximation of smooth quantities is going to vary in terms of quality depending on where we are. Like in the bottom left of this mesh here, on the left-hand side, it's pretty dense, so I actually could get a pretty good resolution. On the right-hand side, there's like big holes, and I really can't do interesting computation between those vertices. So oftentimes there's a bias toward good-looking meshes, like the one on the right-hand side. And I'll try to point out during this course when we're kind of making that assumption, just so that you understand there is some interface between smooth and discrete. So for example, here, if I wanted to understand the space of functions on a square, and discretize it, one way that I could do that might be to just sample my function, you know, uh, the vertices, and then interpolate to the insides of the triangles, like uh, what you do in computer graphics using very central coordinates. But then a really crazy thing happens, right? Because my function is somehow higher resolution on the bottom left than the bottom right, and there's not a great reason for that. In any event, for now, let's return to mesh topology and define a few more useful terms. One useful term is the word valence. The valence of a vertex is the number of edges that are going out of it. So for example, in the ver uh, vertex circled in red here, the valence is six because there are six outgoing edges. Uh, another word that we use for valence sometimes is degree. These are synonyms. Either one is, is perfectly fine. Now, there's an awesome fundamental topological theorem that we should all know and love, even if we can't derive it ourselves, which is like your instructor, um, which is something uh, called Euler's theorem, which says the following. If I take a surface and I tri triangulate it, by the way, this is a specific instance of Euler's theorem rather than the most general one. In any event, if I take a surface and I triangulate it, and now I look at the number of vertices, V, minus the number of edges E, plus the number of faces F, I get a topological invariant. This is true for meshes without boundary. There's a more complicated version for with boundary. I'm not gonna worry about it for now. So here, our uh, topological invariant is this number chi. It's called the Euler characteristic, which is equal to two minus two times the genus G, where the genus G here is equal to the number of holes. So for instance, a sphere has no holes. So the genus is zero. This donut has one hole, so the genus is one. This crazy two donuts glued together has two holes, so the genus is two. Okay, so this is Euler's uh, theorem. And it's really amazing. What it says is that I can recover this topological piece of information about my surface just from adding up the number of vertices, edges, and, and, and triangular faces, and that Try as I might, I can mesh the sphere in many different ways, right? I could have a really dense triangle mesh. I could basically just have a single tetrahedron. And in either case, I still get that Euler's theorem holds. I still get 2 minus 2 times g when I take v minus e plus f. And this theorem is not one that we're going to be able to derive in this course. Why? Well, we haven't really defined the genus of a surface, like the number of holes in a careful way. Um, we're not really equipped to do that yet, um, so I'm kind of jumping forward 10 lectures to show you a really nice theorem that we can use to analyze triangle meshes, but I think this is a famous enough result that it's worth at least quoting and kind of acknowledging here. And in fact, let's, let's write it on the board. So we have a V minus E plus F is equal to chi. One additional thing to notice here, incidentally, is that chi is a pretty small number, usually. And by small, I just mean like close to zero. Um, in particular, uh, notice that like G is, you know, the number of holes on a surface is not typically humongous, unless you're like meshing a sponge. Um, so that's a pretty reasonable assumption. Chi is kind of like zero to first order. Now, we can manipulate this formula in a few ways to learn more things about triangle meshes, which are useful in our everyday lives. Sorry, the pen is like not super clear. Let's see if I can trace over it here, if that only makes it worse. Ah, that's okay. So V minus E plus F is equal to chi. All right, so first of all, 
remember that I have a surface without boundaries. So like any of the examples we see here, right? The, 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 it doesn't just end somewhere. So we can do a little bit of a combinatorial argument here. And let's say that I have two triangles that share an edge, like that. Uh, so really this edge is glued together, but I'm just gonna break it up for visualization purposes. Well, if I kind of look at this figure, what do I notice? Well, I notice that every edge is adjacent to exactly two triangles, right? One on its left, one on its right. Every triangle has three edges. So if I put all that together, what do I get? I get that two times the number of edges is equal to three times the number of faces, like that. So again, here's it drawn more nicely. Each edge is adjacent to two faces. Each face has three edges. So that allows us to say that 2e equals 3f. Again, I am assuming that my triangle mesh has no boundary. OK, so now what can I do? Well, if I start here, then I can eliminate either e or f. So in particular, let's keep f around. So e is equal to 3 halves f, just by dividing both sides by 2. So what do I get? I get v minus 3 halves f plus f is equal to chi. So in other words, we have a minus 3 half plus 1. So v minus f over 2 is equal to chi. Cool? So that's kind of nice. This is another useful little identity to know. And moreover, well, this number is kind of close to zero, right? Remember, it's 2 minus 2g. So for a typical surface, this is not like a ginormous thing, right? This is close to zero. Notice I'm about to make a physicist-style argument, you know, <laughs> like a small integer is basically zero. OK, so if that's true, then we can make an approximation, which is that f is approximately equal to 2 times the number of vertices. I mean, in reality, what is it? It's going to be f is equal to 2 times the number of vertices minus 2 times chi, but we're going to assume that's kind of close to 0. So we definitely need that squiggly equals sign here. <laughs> OK, so we've got this nice little approximation here. Well, why would I do that? So what do we know? We know that uh, 2e is equal to 3f. f is roughly equal to 2 times v. So let's combine all of these things together and see what we get. So first of all, uh, let's, let's write everything in terms of the uh, number of vertices. So we have that the edges, this is equal to 3 halves times the number of faces. OK, well, faces is 2 times uh, vertices. So roughly, the number of edges is equal to 3 times the number of vertices. And we have roughly that the number of faces on a surface triangle mesh is 2 times the number of vertices. We can make these things more precise by incorporating chi, but I don't feel like it. These are just rules of thumb. And because remember that e, f, and v are typically very large numbers, right? Triangle meshes are covered with tons and tons of triangles. OK. Now, we're going to derive one more kind of useful thing, which is the average valence of every vertex. OK, so let's think for a second here. I'm going to draw something very profound, which is a single edge. <laughs> and notice that, of course, an edge has two vertices on it. OK, so what does that mean? So remember the, the, the valence of a vertex is equal to the number of edges that go out of it. Yeah? So every edge kind of contributes to two different valences, right? It contributes to the valence of its uh, first endpoint and its second endpoint. All right. So what is the average valence Well, it's kind of like well, I remember that I have the uh, number of edges multiplied by 2 divided by the number of vertices. And that's basically by this argument that every edge is adjacent to two vertices. Um, so if I summed up all the valences over a whole triangle mesh, I'd get 2e. Uh, if I want the average valence per vertex, then I've got to divide by uh, the number of vertices here. <laughs> 
OK, but remember that 2e is equal to 6v, approximately. Right, so this is 6v divided by v, which of course is just equal to 6. So what did we just show in this little expression here? We showed that on a manifold triangle mesh surface without boundary, the average valence per vertex is roughly 6. Now remember that really there's some term involving the uh, uh, Euler characteristic here, but this term does not involve v, e, or f, so it's just some small integer. And moreover, it's divided by v, so it's, it's just some small fraction. So it's really 6 plus some, some epsilon, which looks kind of like 1 over v. Okay, and so this is a useful sanity check when you're writing your code. I strongly suggest that, like, if you write code for lo loading a triangle mesh, you go ahead and check all these identities and make sure that the counts of vertices, edges, and faces are roughly correct just to debug your code. So again, here's our little summary of what we've done so far, that E is roughly 3V, F is roughly 2V, and the average valence per vertex is roughly 6. In fact, a lot of people define an object called a regular mesh, which is a mesh where all the vertices have valence 6, and they're actually not so hard to find. Like if I have a subdivision rule, uh, as in uh, what we do in computer graphics, you'll see that most vertices that subdivision rules create have valence 6, which is nice. In fact, sometimes we use the, word, the phrase irregular vertice, uh, vertex to refer to a vertex whose valence is not 6. All right, so let's clean up a little bit. OK. So kind of continuing to explore all the topics that we talked about uh, when we were defining smooth surfaces, the other thing that we should talk about is orientability. So for example, here I'm showing you a triangle mesh of a Mobius strip. One thing to note, by the way, is that this is possible. It's perfectly fine to uh, compute a triangle mesh of a Mobius strip, but it's not an orientable surface, and we have to figure out what that means. Now, remember how we defined orientable surfaces in the smooth case. Essentially, we said that an orientable surface is one that admits a continuous field of normal vectors. So that's kind of like what I've shown you here, right? So this uh, torus uh, is the surface, and the normal vectors are the black arrows. But there's a problem. So if I want to talk about an orientable triangle mesh, well, now I'm in some trouble. Like on this dolphin here, what happens at the vertices and edges? Like what does it even mean to have a continuous normal vector field on a triangulated surface that looks like this? It's really not so clear. So we've got to go back to the drawing board. And here's the nice intuition we can make. So if we return to our torus surface, we're going to use a little duality trick here. In particular, if you take your right hand and you raise it up, incidentally I'm filming in this uh, thing that I think flips the video backwards, so I'm not clear. It'll probably look like my left hand to you all, but this is my right hand. <laughs> if I take my right hand and I point my thumb in the direction of one of these normal vectors, one of the black vectors on the surface, and I wrap my fingers around, well, when I wrap my fingers, they move in a counterclockwise direction. Yeah. So for every normal vector in the plane adjacent to that normal vector, I've given it some notion of what it means to move counterclockwise, <laughs> right? By sticking my thumb parallel to the normal and orienting the plane perpendicular to that. Those of you who have taken a physics class should be very used to right-hand rule-style reasoning by now. So here's the nice thing. On a triangle mesh, I can do exactly the same thing, <laughs> right? So I can put my thumb up parallel to the normal of a triangle on my triangle mesh and wrap my fingers around like that. And now, if I take two adjacent triangles and unfold, I can move my hand over this way, and I still have a reasonable notion of counterclockwise. So this is a basic idea of a right-hand rule, right? That I can consistently place a right-hand rule at every point on a surface. I can draw like a little circles that are all oriented uh, in, in the same fashion. Now, what does it mean for two triangles to be consistently oriented? Well, this is kind of a sneaky trick. So let's say that I have two triangles that share an edge, and I want to assign to both of them a counterclockwise direction. Well, what does that mean? I can think of clockwise and counterclockwise as kind of dividing the set of ways that it could order the vertices of a triangle into two different sets, right? So for instance, if I have a triangle here, 
And let's say that I order the vertices. So I'm going to give them numbers. And now let's say that I order them counterclockwise. C, C, W. Well, there's a few different ways I can do that, right? I can go one, two, three, two, three, one, three, one, two. And if I want to order them clockwise, I can also do that, right? So that would be like three, two, one, two, one, three, one, three, two. And these are all of the possible ways to order the three vertices of the triangles. They're just divided into two sets. Okay, and so these sets are the counterclockwise set and the clockwise set. So what does it mean for two triangles to be consistently oriented? In other words, if one of them is counterclockwise, then I want to make sure its neighbor is also counterclockwise in the same fashion as kind of suggested in this figure. Well, let's just do an example like this. So maybe here we have our same triangle. So we have one, two, three. Now we're going to add four like that. So. Let's list all of the counterclockwise orderings of the first triangle, conveniently. That's exactly what I've done here. And now, so let's call this, so we'll call this triangle A. So this is A, <laughs> up to geometric change. Remember, we're doing topology right now. Here's triangle B. So uh, this is our table for A. If we want to do, we'll just do the counterclockwise ordering for uh, B. So let's see here. So that would be three, two, four. Two, four, three, four, three, two. And now let's just look at the shared edge. So the shared edge between A and B is right here. Right? It's between vertex two and vertex three. And we're always going to read from left to right. Okay, well, let's see here. So we have three, two, four, two, four, three, and so on. Um, okay. Well, if I consistently orient these two triangles, essentially what's going to end up happening is the following. So if I move in a counterclockwise direction on this triangle, notice that I go from 2 to 3, right? 2, 3, so 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1. This one's a little bit complicated, but notice that if I read from left to right and I look for that edge, I can think of 3, 1, 2, then adding another vertex here, I get 2, 3 again. And now take a look. I get 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2. And why is that? Well, if I order these vertices counterclockwise, notice that the edge 3, 2 ends up flipped up upside down. OK, so two triangles that share an edge, if I consistently orient them, in other words, I give them both counterclockwise orderings, then what will happen is the shared edge will end up in reverse order on those two triangles. OK, so in order for a mesh to be discreetly orientable, what that means is I'm going to assign an ordering for each of the triangles. And that ordering is non-unique. I can cyclically permute it if I want. But then wherever I find that edge, the triangles that share an edge Every edge will have at most one time with any of the ordering of its two vertices. So if I have two, three for one of the, the instances of the edge, the other time that I see it, it'll be three, two. So if I can do that consistently over the whole surface, I can assign an orientation to every triangle so that every shared edge has the edge going forward on one triangle and reverse in the other, then the entire mesh is discreetly orientable uh, and it sort of admits a continuous normal field, or at least the dual of one, which is a right-hand rule every which way. Notice this is kind of nice, because essentially what it's allowing us to do is to define orientability intrinsically. I'm not defining orientability in a way that relies on the space around the triangle mesh, or in fact on the geometry at all. Um, this is purely topological stuff, right? It's just dependent on the numbering of the triangles, which is different than how we did it for a smooth surface, which was somehow geometric in nature, right? We, we really had to find uh, normal vectors. Okay, so in our last bit of lecture here, we're going to talk about a kind of practical concern, which is how to actually store a triangulated surface on your computer. And there's many different data structures for storing surfaces. At the end of the day, 
we have to represent both the geometry and the topology of the surface, and we're going to show that there are a lot of different ways to do that. So let's get started. Probably the simplest way to store a triangle mesh, certainly the most familiar if you're like writing graphics card code and rendering and so on, is just a long list of triangles. So essentially we have no topological information at all, right? If I have two triangles that share a vertex, or two vertices for that matter, then those two vertices will get repeated twice. Um, this is the triangle soup uh, format. As you can imagine, it's not particularly convenient for geometry processing, um, but it is convenient for rendering, right? Because at the end of the day, your graphics card can stream this massive number of triangles and just render them one after the next. So this is the most uh, useful format for doing that. So for instance, in very old school style OpenGL, there was this GL begin open uh, begin GL triangles, and you could just give it you know one triangle after the next, and it rendered them onto the screen. Newer versions of OpenGL no longer have this uh, command; it's been deprecated. But essentially, similar machinery exists. We're just taking a long list of triplets of vertices and rendering them one after the next. But notice there's a lot of repeated information, right? If I have two triangles that share an edge, the vertices along that edge are repeated twice in this format. So one way to factor that out would be to make something called a shared vertex structure. So here, uh, the basic point is that I'm going to have two arrays, one of faces and one of vertices. So now, um, for example, let's say that I have this two triangle mesh that you see on the uh, slide here. What am I going to do? Well, I will store five rows with Vs on them to give us the coordinates of V1, V2, V3. Oops. I guess I could have made that v4. <laughs> Whatever, so there's really four rows, v1, v2, v3, and v5. My apologies. On the other hand, uh, now when I store our faces, we're going to think of our faces as pointers into that vertex array. right? So for example, notice there's 1, 5, 3, which would be face 1, or f1, and then 5, 1, 2, which would be f2. Yeah. And so the nice thing about this structure is that I don't, for example, store v1 twice, once for triangle f1 and a second time for triangle f2. Um, so for example, the .obj triangle mesh format, like if you download a mesh and it's in um, obj format, that's really what's going on inside of that file there. Now, this is already a little bit more useful for uncovering a tiny bit of topological structure on our triangle mesh, right? If nothing else, uh, we can identify when two triangles share a vertex pretty easily. But let's take a look at a pretty simple algorithm we might want to uh, implement on a triangle mesh. So let's say that we want to smooth out the vertex position. So one very simple strategy for doing that, which we'll see later, is called Laplacian smoothing, um, looks like the following. So for each vertex v, I'm just going to take the weighted average of its neighbors, and I'm going to average the position of the vertex v with the positions of its neighbors. So if I want to draw a little picture of it, you know, so maybe here is a, a vertex and here are its neighboring triangles. So in my smoothing operation, maybe I replace the position of that center vertex with the average of the position of that center vertex and its neighbors as some way to smooth the mesh out. Now, a question you might ask is, how easy is it to implement this algorithm using the data structure for a mesh that we've, we've generated? In particular, notice that this algorithm has a for loop around all the neighbors of a central vertex. So if we return to our shared vertex structure here, I would argue that this is not a very, very convenient way for doing things like looping over the neighbors of a vertex, which is a very simple operation that we often do on a triangle mesh. And in fact, there are all kinds of queries that kind of look like this that are very typical in mesh processing. Things like enumerate the vertices that are adjacent to a central vertex, like these guys, or the faces that are adjacent to a central vertex, the edges, maybe the edges adjacent to a face, the edges adjacent to a vertex, the faces adjacent to an edge, and so on. Like essentially, a, a very typical thing that we have to do is to do a lot of crawling around the triangle mesh topology locally. And so far, we don't really have pointers to how to move around in our mesh, uh, given this uh, simple structures that we've developed so far. Essentially, the key word here are like neighboring and adjacent. That you know, the same way that we do linked lists in our undergrad uh, data structures course, we want a data structure that can very easily kind of walk around to local neighborhoods on our triangle mesh.
So now I'm going to introduce one more common data structure, which I think is worth knowing about if you're going to do a lot of mesh processing, and that's something called the half-edge data structure. So the half-edge data structure actually has three pieces in it. It has a list of vertices and faces, a list of vertices and, and, and faces, um, just like we had before. But in addition to that, we're going to have one more set of objects that are called half-edges. Moreover, we're going to endow the vertices and the faces and the half edges with a little bit more information. Now, what is this term half edge? It's kind of weird. Essentially, the point is that rather than having a list of edges in our mesh, like what we see here, we're going to take every edge and we're going to divide it into two, like one version of the edge going up and one version of the edge going down. And we're going to have a big soup of different pointers uh, that give ways to move around in our mesh. Okay, so again, a half edge is associated to a face. You can see like this half edge is sitting on this face, this half edge is sitting on that one. And typically we orient the, the half edges, so for example, as I've drawn here, to go in the clockwise order. Or here's another one. Okay. So a half edge is an oriented edge, and it's oriented to align with the orientation we chose for the face. Um, this data structure does not work for a non-orientable mesh, incidentally. We need our mesh to be orientable. Okay, so again, remember that we have vertices, half edges, and faces, and each one of these is going to have associated to it pointers to all kinds of other information. In particular, we're gonna say that a vertex will store an arbitrary outgoing half edge. So for example, this vertex in the center here might store this outgoing half edge, which uh, is just some way to go from vertices to one of the adjacent edges. We'll see that that's actually enough, and moreover, it's okay that this is uh, arbitrary. Next, we'll say that a face stores some adjacent half edge. So for instance, I can go from this face here to any one of these three half edges that are adjacent to this triangle face. And now all the magic happens for the half edge itself. In particular, it stores flip, next, face, and vertex. Okay, so let's draw this a little bit bigger. So here is a single triangle. And uh, let's see, I always get counterclockwise wrong. So here, is uh, a single edge. So uh, now let's see if we can draw all of these different things. So first of all, the flip of an edge is the half edge associated to the shared edge that is oriented the other way, right? So this guy would be the flip. Okay. Now we have the next. The way we're going to do that is think of it pointing into the tail of the next. So here would be the next. Uh, okay, after that, we need the face associated to the half edge. So that would be like the triangle that it's adjacent to. And we're going to have a vertex, which usually we think of as like the base of the half edge. So this would be the vertex. So, as you probably can imagine, setting up a half edge data structure is like pointer soup, right? Because every half edge has a pointer to another half edge, uh, which is the flip. It has a pointer to the next half edge, has a pointer to a face, a pointer to a vertex. Every face has a pointer to a half edge. Every vertex has a pointer to a half edge. Um, so essentially all of the headache in setting up a half edge data structure occurs when um, you're first getting started, like you know, loading it in from an OBJ file. But Half edges allow you to do ridiculously, ridiculously cool things. So for instance, let's say that I want to iterate over the neighbors of a vertex on my triangle mesh, right? So maybe I'm given a pointer to this vertex here, and I want to make a for loop over all the neighbors of this vertex. Now, if you look at that OBJ file format I talked about before, you can convince yourself pretty easily that this is a pretty difficult operation. But in fact, doing it on a half edge data structure takes constant time, or I guess time proportional to the number of neighbors, which is really what you want. So here's how we can do it. Uh, and this is given on the slide here. So let's say that I'm in a vertex, and I want to iterate over its neighbors. So that's the function on this slide. The first thing that I can do is compute v.out. Right, so here's our, our initial vertex v. 
then this is maybe v dot out, right? So it's just some vertex coming out of this half mesh, right? So secretly, this is associated to some triangle in our mesh like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and move around in our mesh in a uh, clockwise or counterclockwise fashion. I don't remember which, so I'm going to step through my code here and we'll discover. So, and that's what this uh, do while loop is that you see on the slide here. Okay, so now uh, let's, let's take a look at the different steps here. So process is essentially going to be just a generic function that we're going to call to process each of its neighbors. So let's see, if we compute e.flip.from, right, that's the first line of our do while loop here, what does that give us? So flip gives us this half edge here, and then from is going to give us this one, right? So we'll call process on this vertex, which is good because it's one of the neighbors of v. That's what we wanted. Now we do e equals e dot flip dot next, right? So here is e currently, and now the question is, what is e now? So here is e dot flip, right? It's this other vertex adjacent to it. And now remember that there's another triangle here. So what is flip dot next? Well, if this is e dot flip, well, remember that next, I kind of follow the head into the tail of the next one. Here is e dot flip dot next. And notice that I now have a half edge pointing to the next vertex. So this is the next one that's going to get processed in this do while loop. So at the end of the day, if you kind of stare at this loop, you'll see that what it's doing is it's calling process on this vertex, and then it's calling process on that vertex, and so on, moving in uh, counter, uh, well, I guess the way I've drawn it here, uh, clockwise order. Okay, so take, if you kind of step back at the for loop, one thing you can convince yourself is that, well, the amount of time that it's going to take is just proportional to the number of neighbors of V, which is about as good as I can hope for. Um, this is much better than the other data structures for meshes that we've done. Okay, so the half edge is a really cool data structure. It allows you to do lots of walking around in mesh topology, which is super useful for different applications. Okay, so one thing to note is that we're only scratching the surface. There are all kinds of different data structures for representing triangle meshes, and these are just a few of the common ones. Um, for example, one thing you might want to do is ask, what data structure can I use to minimize the amount of space that a triangle mesh takes up? Right? Our, our structures here have been quite redundant, right? Like a half edge has pointers every which way. I'm clearly not worried about um, saving space. Or a different question I might ask is like, what's the best format for streaming a triangle mesh? Like, if I'm in a virtual reality application, I want to display uh, some coarse version of my uh, geometry very quickly, then maybe I should stream an approximation to my surface before streaming the full thing. There are all kinds of interesting papers out there, and I encourage you to do some digging to read about a bit more. In fact, one of the kind of funny things that's going to show up a lot in this course is an interesting primal dual structure. So, just to get us thinking about this and suggest what we'll do later in this course, let's think about what it means to represent a function on a surface. So a function on a surface is roughly a real number assigned to every point on a surface. So for instance, I can visualize that as colors on the surface of the bunny, where every color corresponds to a different function value, like we see here. And if I want to store that on a triangle mesh, probably what I'd do is store a long vector of values, one value per vertex. Uh, and then, of course, like for instance, in uh, 6837, our graphics course, we talked about how to take one value per vertex of a triangle mesh and use barycentric interpolation to actually render this object on the scene by just interpolating uh, along the surface. In fact, we'll use that construction later on in this course to uh, develop the piecewise linear finite element method. But a simple question we might ask for now, just to get you thinking, is what is the integral of our function f? Like, how can we integrate it? So remember that like, probably the simplest way to approximate the integral of a function is to take samples and kind of multiply them by areas, right? Like the, the, if I take the integral of a function in one dimension, then I might sample it at a bunch of points and then take each sample and scale it by kind of the size of the region around that point. And I can do that on a triangle mesh. So for instance, I might define a dual cell and say, okay, I have one value per vertex of my triangle mesh. So maybe one simple thing I could do 
this is actually not a great idea, but, but one thing I could do would be take every edge and divide it in half and draw this little region omega i associated to every vertex, which is basically just cutting off some piece of, uh, of the adjacent triangles. Okay, so one thing that I could do is, is approximate the integral of a function if all I know is its values on the vertices by summing, oops, there should be a sum on the right-hand side, my apologies. Actually, no, I'm sorry, uh, there shouldn't be here uh, because this is integrated just over one of these cells omega i. And if I wanted the integral of my function over the whole surface, I would sum this expression over all of the vertices i. So again, if I want to integrate a function on a surface, one very simple thing to do is to assign some little area adjacent to every vertex and then sum the value of that vertex times the area over the whole mesh. Now, this doesn't seem like a very profound idea, mostly because it's, it's not. Um, we'll see that the choice of omega i here is a little tricky. Like the picture I've drawn isn't particularly great, um, but there are other ones that are not so hard. But it already kind of suggests an interesting structure, and that's something called a dual complex. And I'm just going to kind of plant this in your mind now, because later on when we discuss discrete exterior calculus or some of those ideas, this primal dual structure is going to become really critical. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a new mesh which is going to flip the roles of vertices and faces. So essentially what I'm going to do, you can see that the green mesh is what I'll call the primal mesh, and that's a tr triangle mesh. The blue mesh is the dual mesh, and how I'm going to construct it is I'm going to put a vertex on the dual mesh for every face in the triangle mesh. So see that there's like a point in the dual uh, blue mesh in the interior of every triangle that's green. And I'm going to connect two of those vertices if those two triangles that they correspond to in the green mesh are adjacent to one another. And what that ends up forming is this object called the dual complex. And this is actually a manifold simplicial complex. It's not triangular anymore. You can see that its faces are uh, hexagonal. There's actually some deep reasons for that. But it's sort of the dual of our triangle mesh. And this is a structure that we can build up a lot, right? So for instance, when we talked about this area problem, maybe it makes sense to think of the area assigned to one of the green vertices as the area of the blue cell around that vertex. And this is actually roughly what we do in practice. So the reality is that for one surface, we actually have two meshes. We have a triangle mesh, like on this bunny here that's shown in uh, blue. And then we have a dual mesh, which is no, no longer triangular, but it does have a surface-like structure, um, for in this, in, in this case, uh, shown in red. So we're going to see that oftentimes it's useful to navigate not only a surface, um, a mesh of a surface, but also its dual mesh. And so one thing that we could do is actually store two half-edge data structures. We could have a half-edge data structure for the green mesh and a half-edge data structure for the blue mesh. And that is going to lead us to a new data structure, which, unsurprisingly, it's called the quad edge data structure. Um, so the basic point is that we're only missing one operation, which is how to flip from primal to dual. And when we add that, what we end up with is this full data structure, this quad edge. So essentially, in a quad edge data structure, notice that every edge in our triangle mesh, like the green guy, now has four edges associated to it, two primal half edges and two uh, dual half edges. And rather than having flips as what we store in our quad edge data structure, we're instead going to store an operation called ROT, for rotation. Notice if I apply rotate twice, then I end up with flip. But if I only apply it once, then effectively what I've done is move from the primal mesh to the dual mesh. So for instance, if I want to iterate over all of the vertices, uh, all of the triangles adjacent to a particular vertex, in some sense, that might be easier to implement by iterating over all the dual vertices uh, that are nearby by just doing a bunch of uh, following things in a cycle. Um, so the quad edge data structure is a super useful one. Um, we're not going to need it for a little while in this course, but later on when we do some primal dual methods, we're going to see that this is a useful data structure to have around. Now, something we're not going to cover in this class, but is worth thinking about. Now, there are algorithms out there that take a triangle mesh and edit it in different ways. It's usually to simplify. Uh, in fact, the most famous technique is one by Garland and Heckbert, um, goes back many years, where essentially what they do is they iteratively make little simplifications to a mesh by doing things like contracting an edge. Um, which you would see on, on the uh, image here. So 
One of the things that is uh, something that people often like to do on triangle meshes are topological uh, operations like editing. And a fun thing to do is to think about what all the bookkeeping is for each of these operations. If I want to implement vertex removal, edge collapses, or face collapses, which are kind of shown in blue here, what am I going to have to do to update all of the pointers inside of my half edge or my quad edge data structure? And you'll see that it's, it's a really it's like rewiring like a piece of electronics. This gets pretty crazy pretty fast, but the good news is this constant time, which is really what we need. So the takeaway here basically is that complex data structures enable simpler traversal of our mesh, but it makes the bookkeeping a lot more difficult. You know, if I edit my mesh a little bit, um, suddenly I have to rewire all kinds of pointers inside of my half edge or quad edge data structure. So in the final few minutes of, of today's discussion, I thought I'd suggest a few other geometric representations just to make sure you all understand that triangle meshes are common, but they're not the only ones. So for instance, a very different one is something called implicit surfaces. These are sort of being reborn in the machine learning literature right now, uh, thanks to things like deep STF, uh, which uh, deal with essentially an implicit representation of a surface as a sine distance function. Um, but implicits have been around for many decades. Essentially, an implicit surface representation doesn't represent the surface directly, but rather says a surface is the zero level set of some function that lives around the surface. This can be useful for things like uh, Boolean operations, which are particularly easy to express in terms of implicit representation. In fact, there's an entire uh, fluid dynamics uh, technique where you think of a fluid as a collection of particles, but then if you want to extract the surface of the fluid, in this smooth particle hydrodynamic setting, you'll have to extract a, uh, an implicit surface. Uh, moreover, uh, for instance, surface tension is a pretty common phenomenon that you want to simulate. And if you want to find that, you're going to have to compute curvature of an implicit surface if you do it in the SPH representation. In computer-aided design, there's a very different surface representation that's very popular, which are piecewise polynomial or rational patches. So uh, in our A37 course, we talked about how to build up splines out of little spline pieces. Um, you can do a similar thing for surfaces as well by like doing bicubic patches and so on. Um, this is really important in computer-aided design where what you care about is like smoothness of the underlying surfaces. So you don't want to be able to see triangular facets. Um, Joining them together, for instance, with like C1 or G1 or C2 continuity is a really important concern and difficult to uh, carry out in CAD uh, software. Um, another challenge is just taking a CAD surface and converting it to a triangle mesh, which gets easy until you start introducing things like Boolean operations, which are quite common in the uh, CAD regime. Related to this representation are subdivision surfaces where well, these are particularly popular in computer graphics literature where you have a triangle mesh or a quad mesh or some other mesh and it's accompanied with a rule for taking that mesh and subdividing it into a smaller and smaller and smaller set of, of or rather a larger set of smaller elements um, that better and better approximate the smooth surface, like what you see here. So that way an artist might just control that coarse mesh, but behind the scenes it's filling in the smooth details. Uh, this was introduced, I think, really to the graphics universe in a Pixar uh, uh, short titled Jerry's Game, which you should watch because it's super cute. Uh, and it's really one of the most common um, surface representations out there. Incidentally, uh, Data structures like the half edge are really well suited for subdivision. You should go back and take a look at like the Catmull Clark subdivision rule. You'll see it's actually not so hard to implement in uh, the half edge structure, which is which is neat. In medical imaging, um, kind of related to SDF uh, style representations are just volumetric images that you can might get from an MRI or some other uh, scan. Um, these ones can get really tricky because sometimes the surface geometry is like the level set of a function that I have sampled on a grid but then the function values are a little noisy, so it's not clear how much differential geometry I can do on the most local scale. One thing that's worth uh, calling out is a particular algorithm called marching cubes, which is a way to extract a surface from one of these volumetric grids. And essentially it's very simple. All it's doing is enumerating all the possible things that can happen to a surface in a cell if it's the zero level set of some function.
And then finally, one of the most important surface representations, but also the most boring in some sense, is a point cloud, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a big pile of points. Uh, so if you use LiDAR scanners in autonomous driving, for example, then what you'll get back out is a point cloud. So point cloud processing and analysis is particularly important uh, when it comes to three-dimensional computer vision, um, because three-dimensional computer vision systems typically don't give you a triangle mesh of the 3D world around you. They just give you a bunch of points. Um, Doing this is really tricky because we no longer have any topology at all. There's just like a sampling of geometry. Uh, so algorithms that operate on point clouds have to do all kinds of interesting approximations and convergence arguments. We're going to return to this a little bit when we talk about the Laplace operator. And then toward the end of this course, we'll talk a bit about deep learning on 3D geometric representations. And this will be one of the major ones that co comes up in that community thanks to its application in autonomous driving. So as usual, I've gone over time here, but hopefully you have some idea of what it means to discretize a smooth surface and to define both smooth surfaces and manifold triangle meshes. This is going to be really important definitions to keep in mind as we dive further and further into surface geometry in this course. So you should return to these definitions quite a bit and make sure you understand them. But with that, uh, it's a pleasure to tell you guys about some surfaces, and next time we'll start talking about curvature, distances, and other local things we can do on surfaces. So I'll see you next time.